morning, everyone. I'm Sakib Roman, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Law, North South University. We would like to welcome you all at today's webinar today. It would be an absolutely, it, uh, it would be a delight for us uh, to be able to listen to Professor Flora Johns, who this Friday morning has very kindly made the time to talk on international law and the challenge. And before we request Professor John to stop, I would like to bring to the notice of the listeners that the chat box is open and that they may address any questions there in the box. The audience is requested to please keep their microphones off at all times. And lastly, I'd like to extend my thanks on behalf of the Department of Law to all of you present here today. Now, regarding our guest speaker, Paul Johns is a professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW Sydney, working in the area of public international law, legal theory, law and development, law and society, or social legal studies, and law and technology. A graduate of Harvard Law School and Melbourne University, Professor John Stark studies emergent patterns of governance on the global plane and their social, political, and economic implications, employing an interdisciplinary approach that draws on the social sciences and humanities and combines the study of public and private law. In 2021, Florida commenced a four-year Australian Research Council Future Fellowship. Before joining UNSW, Flora was co-director of the Sydney Centre for International Law at the University of Sydney. She has also held visiting appointments in Canada, the UK, and the US. Now, before we listen to Professor Jones, I'd like to request Professor Mohamed Rizwan, the Islam Chair of the Department of Law at North South University, for his introductory remark. Thank you, Saki, for your introduction. First, let me thank uh, Professor Far Jones for her very generous response to my invitation. It would be a privilege to listen to Professor Jones this morning. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, uh, audience, wherever you may be, depending on that. Professor Jones has been working in this area for a couple of years. I have had the pleasure of reading her uh, AGIL article recently published. And I'm sure she is going to write more on this. And this is an area on which many mainstream international law scholars may not have uh, written or thought in the past, but they would have to think because this is a very emerging area, flourishing area. The, uh, governance by data is not just a phenomenon in, within national boundaries. States are increasingly using various forms of digital technology uh, in, in many ways, maybe for responding to public health emergencies during COVID, in responding to other kinds of emergencies, uh, in, in terms of international law, or international institutions. These digital technologies are being used for bio collecting biometric data, for sort of regulating refugee programs, for tracing the movement of uh, some particular forms of weaponry. So in many ways, these technologies are posing questions that contemporary international law is perhaps not best equipped to deal with. And these are posing certain questions that are perhaps yet to be fully explored in the main discourse on public international law. So with that note, I'm sure we are going to get interesting points, new insights from Professor Jones in our two days webinar. I invite you all once again to listen to Professor Jones and raise your questions and contribute to the dialogue today. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Professor Jones, um, whenever you're comfortable, please do start with that. Thank you so much, Sakib, and thank you, uh, Professor Islam, for those kind words, and um, Sakib Rahman for that kind introduction, um, and also Nazma Sakib for all the technical coordination of this event. And hello, everyone. Good morning to you. Good afternoon from here in Sydney. It's a great pleasure to be here with you speaking about recent work that I'm doing um, as part of an ongoing project that I've been working on for about the last um, five or six years. Um, part of which has been funded by the Australian Research Council. 
So um, today I wanted to um, start by just giving you a sense of where I'll take you over the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to put an argument that arises from this ongoing research that I've been doing into the use of digital technology in particular in humanitarian and development work. But here I'm making an argument that relates to international legal work more broadly. So I wanna outline that argument and then I will move to giving you some empirical examples of ways in which various actors, national governments, international organizations, non-state actors are having growing recourse to digital technology and digital data in various aspects of international legal work. When I talk about a growing recourse to the digital, I'll then explain what I mean by the digital, the contrast between, and the contrast between that and analog ways of thinking and working. And then after that, I'll identify four challenges that emerge for international law from this growing use of digital technology and digital data. After that, um, so that we don't wallow in despair and, um, and uh, are not overwhelmed by a sense of these challenges, I did want to identify some possibilities, some openings that this growing ubiquity of digital technology in international legal work could present for international lawyers. And then I'll briefly return to and restate the argument before opening to dialogue with you, which I'm very much looking forward to and questions through the um, chat box, as Sakib mentioned. So let me first then um, outline the main argument of today, why I'm um, going to be uh, showing you and talking you through um, uh, these uh, challenges today. So as you know, increasingly, there are many excellent analyses of the global digital economy. And some of these, um, for example, Julie Cohen's recent book, describe particular ways in which this global digital economy, um, particular aspects of its legal infrastructure, ways in which it is supported and sustained by law. Um, and also some of this literature on the global digital economy highlights various ways in which our, both our legal and political infrastructure, the, the frameworks in which um, we've been operating for uh, the past decades, is being transformed by the rise of digital platforms and digital technology. And much of that literature presumes often that the answer for challenges and questions and issues and points of conflict that emerge in this context is to extend or intensify pre-existing frameworks for governance. So we need to cast over these new scenarios more of what we've done before. Um, this is a kind of working assumption of at least some of the literature that I'm alluding to. And some of this literature also holds to received ways of understanding governmental power and calling, into, calling that power into question. So again, it tries to extend over the rise of digital platforms and other forms of digital technology and other repositories of, of um, digital power traditional rubrics and traditional frameworks for analyzing and understanding governmental power and calling that power into question. The argument that I've been, that I want to make today is that it is important to try and confront the transformations to which I just alluded, those transformations in legal and political infrastructure and practice that are associated with the rise of digital technology it's important to try and confront those transformations on their own terms and by paying attention to what is distinctive or different about them. So not only um, the continuities, because there are still continuities, not everything is new, of course, but, um, but paying attention to the discontinuities, the way in which um, the challenges that we face and the techniques we have available to confront those challenges have in some ways shifted. And the second part of this argument is to suggest that um, it is when we're exploring these transformations 
disruptions in legal and political infrastructure and in the operations of power that are associated with growing use of digital technology and, um, and the rise of digital platforms, that it's important to revisit and reconsider some of the traditional building blocks of law and, um, and legal analysis and practice and in my case, I'm particularly focused on the building blocks of international law analysis and practice. So this second uh, paragraph here on this slide really sketches the, the, the purpose of what I'm trying to um, argue today. So let me, uh, let me take you there then. But before I, I um, sketch, identify some of the challenges and transformations that I've been alluding to, let me just give you some empirical material that will give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about. So the empirical claim that underpins my argument is that digital technology in combination with many other forces, some of them very old and long-standing forces like forces of capital, um, is rerouting and reconfiguring the international legal work of states, international organizations and non-state actors on the global plane in many areas. And some of these areas include the um, practice of measurement and statistics on the global plane. So the example I give here is the work of the UN Global Working Group on Big Data and Official Statistics, which was, which is an initiative that was created in 2014 by the UN Statistical Commission to try and examine possibilities for using so-called big data in um, states and international organizations, official statistics and building capability around the use of these big data sources. And this working group has task teams that are looking at how, for instance, um, states and international organizations might use social media data or satellite image data or mobile phone data uh, for tasks like poverty mapping or famine prediction, or generating tourism statistics. So this is ongoing work um, that gives you a sense of the encouragement and support that nations and international organisations are getting and the sort of way in which they're being um, moved in the direction of adopting uh, digital data sources and some data science techniques in the generation of official statistics. Now, obviously the adoption of these practice, practices varies widely across the world. Some um, states and international organizations um, are a lot um, more into this than others for a wide range of reasons. A second example uh, is indicative of the growing use of digital data and digital technology in aid humanitarian relief and emergency management or disaster relief. And the illustrations I give here, uh, the first is the UN Center for Humanitarian Data, which is located in The Hague, it was created in 2017, and it's run by the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And that's focused on increasing the use and impact of digital data in the humanitarian sector. And one of its main initiatives is to maintain and operate uh, a, a repository called the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is uh, designed to hold and share humanitarian data sets under certain conditions to ensure uh, anonymity and um, data protection and so forth. Um, so that's an illustration of the embrace of or the drive to um, try and broaden usage of digital data in humanitarian work generally. And the second illustration here is from the work of the UN High Commission for Refugees. Uh, Professor Islam rightly identified this as an area of um, in which international practice is increasingly being informed by digital technology and by data science. Um, and one illustration of this is the so-called PRIME system, which is a population registration and identity management ecosystem. Um, maintained by UNHCR, which is comprised of all of UNHCR's digital registration, identity management and case management tools and several repositories for personal data that UNHCR maintains 
on people who've sought asylum or been granted refugee status through the UNHCR, um, including biographic and biometric data. And certain aspects of that system are designed to be interoperable with states' national um, refugee registration systems. And of course, there's much more that could be said about each of these examples, but I'm really just trying to give you a, a quick overview of the landscape of to support this claim that I'm making, the empirical claim that we're seeing digital technology and data science increasingly across the range of international legal work. So this is in evidence also in intelligence and policing. And the illustration here that I've referenced is Interpol's i program, which is a 10 year program um, that Interpol started in 2020 to um, reinforce Interpol's function as quote, a global police information hub. And the first phase focuses on three programs, including an initiative to improve access to biometric data for frontline policing across the world. Uh, again, much more to be said about that, but um, moving right along in our quick bird's eye view, um, environmental protection is another area where we're seeing growing adoption of um, digital technology and growing encouragement to um, try and employ digital technology. Um, satellite monitoring of deforestation and ocean eutrophication, air pollution and other um, forms of environmental degradation is being encouraged by many actors, but um, including by the UN Environment Programme. Um, for example, the UN Environment Programme recently launched a satellite image analysis technique, um, which analyzes satellite derived chlorophyll concentration levels to try and detect um, potential dead zones in the sea where you've got um, high levels of nutrients and algal blooms and so forth. Um, so, but again, much more to be said there. And in global health, as Professor Islam mentioned, this is something that we've seen um, many governments and international organizations and non-governmental organizations turn to digital tools for um, efforts of pandemic management and also in supply, pain, supply chain management around vaccines. Um, and for a number of years, we've been seeing efforts of digital disease surveillance that have tried to use for example, social media as to get early warning of digital disease outbreak. Uh, you may have read about the Google flu trends tool that was um, made public in 2008 and then withdrawn in 2015 when it became clear that initial claims that using search query data to try and anticipate and predict early stages of flu outbreaks uh, was actually not as reliable as they thought it was in the first few years of, of this tool's operation. But since then, uh, many other actors have tried still to persist with and refine techniques of using search query data and other so social media data and other forms of digital data to try and get um, an early indication of outbreaks of disease. For example, the CDC, the US um, Center for Disease Control, runs an annual competition called FluSight, which encourages people to propose ways and develop techniques for using social media to predict flu outbreaks. And in diplomacy, um, obviously in, in, the, in the now ended period of Trump, this was uh, something that was very prominent and visible and the topic of much discussion. Um, the propensity for governments and other players on the international plane in the diplomatic sphere to use social media, the internet and other digital platforms to conduct their international relations. This is sometimes referred to as Twitter diplomacy or hashtag diplomacy or digital diplomacy. And it's worth noting that both the US and the UK have offices of e-diplomacy um, or digital diplomacy. And there've been many instances of major um, points of tension and major sort of interactions occurring through digital platforms. For example, in June, 2018, some of you may remember the instance when the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei tweeted that Israel was, quote, a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated, end quote, to which the Israeli embassy in Washington responded with a gif from the movie Mean Girls depicting Queen Bee Regina George asking, why are you so obsessed with me? So uh, this is an instance of the conduct of diplomacy through rather unorthodox digital means. 
And I see that your own um, Minister of, of uh, State for Foreign Affairs, um, Mr. Sharia Alam, seems to be a very avid user of Twitter, although your Prime Minister not so much. So I hope that you've heard a sense from those many examples of this, uh, in the empirical claim that underpins my argument that we are seeing growing use, although uneven use of digital technology and uh, data science in um, various aspects of international legal work and international legal relations. So what is it that we might uh, characterize as distinctive about the digital as compared to analog modes of relating and um, making knowledge? Um, so this, um, let me first speak briefly to these images that I put up here as representative. These are maps from a 2017 paper that proposed a computational framework to accurately predict um, poverty in 552 communes of Senegal using a combination of environmental data and um, mobile phone data records. So you can see in the first, at the top, uh, the map that was used as a map of, of um, the, what's called the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index in Senegal that was in use in 2016. And then the second is a map that was um, the outcome of this computational method that was proposed by the authors of this paper that I've referenced at the bottom, um, which they validated against commune level poverty values um, estimated from census data. So that's a kind of visual representation of the contrast that I'm drawing. But what I'm suggesting is that these are really, and this is not my suggestion alone, it's been um, something that's made in semiotics and writing on computer science and, and um, media studies for decades, that there is something uh, very distinctive about the analog and digital lo uh, logics, even though they are in practice almost always combined. And certainly in legal argument and legal reasoning, they are quite frequently combined. Um, but the analog is characterized by continuous variation um, with multiple values. It's concerned by a concern with continuities, matters of sequence, rhythm, frequency, and with more or less differences. And the examples I've given here, one of the examples I've given here is, is the way in which we understand the likeness or the similarity between legal subjects in a particular jurisdiction. Um, they are understood to be analogues of one another, um, but they are understood to be characterized by a continuum of variation as well. In contrast, digital logics, characteristic of digital technologies, are two valued. They're characterized by the binary logic of um, the symbolic representation system of using zeros and ones. Um, so they're concerned, characterized by a concern with discrete bounded on off units and matters of opposition and discontinuity with either or differences. And they're often, although not always associated with greater precision, but sometimes at the expense of a loss of meaning or nuance. And so the illustration I've given here is the way when um, one indexes a particular place on the Earth's surface to a certain arrangement of ones and zeros in satellite image data. Um, you pinpoint that place in a digital mode, um, it, not on a continuum of variation or by reference to its likeness with other places, but by virtue of its distinct symbolic representation. Um, so the challenges that I'm now going to outline uh, give us a sense of I try, they, what I'm trying to do is trying to sharpen our sense of what shifts or what conflicts or tensions or challenges emerge when international legal work becomes increasingly inflected by digital logic. Now, in one sense, legal work has always been inflected by digital logic. Obviously, the distinction legal, non-legal and other distinctions that are central to legal reasoning and legal thought law versus politics and so forth, these uh, could be understood as characterized, um, these could be understood as, as manifestations of a digital logic. But I nonetheless ma would maintain that law is broadly speaking an analog technology concerned with matters of continuous variation and um, questions of continuity, more or less differences classically. And so what I'm suggesting is that a number of challenges arise when legal work is increasingly conducted or approached 
in this second logical form, in uh, a form characterized overwhelmingly by a digital logic and digital modes of representation and decision. So let me turn to these four challenges. The first is, um, well, before I do so, let me say that I'm presuming for purposes of this talk, some familiarity with um, key features of public international law. And I know that um, many of you are probably very expert in this field. Um, as a regime of law or a set of regimes of law that are structured around states presumed to exercise primary political control over discrete territories to which human populations may be assigned by legal notions of nationality. So one challenge that the turn to the digital presents for international legal work is that many um, forms of power, forms of representation that are prominent in digital formats are not well encapsulated or cannot be well encased or represented um, in these state in state within state territories um, so many groupings and judgments and forms of association that are can be represented or and are represented through digital technology are indifferent to territorial and other jurisdictional boundaries the digital data produces what we might describe as shadow maps that states don't always control or meet. So let me give an example. And this is an example that this picture here um, refers to. Think of uh, the network of undersea cables, uh, which is central to the operation of digital technology. Around the world. Proximity to undersea cable networks can, as you know, gravely affect economic prospects for um, states and people within states. Um, and so this map of digital of the undersea cables that here um, I presented you with is a kind of shadow map of global power and global relation. And if you look at the light shadows and the dark shadows on this map, the dark shadows on this map represent those cables, undersea cables, cables that are owned or leased or were owned or leased by Google, Facebook, Amazon or Microsoft in 2018. So you can see on this map that, you, that a small number of players exercise incredible levels of control over this undersea network, this shadow map of global power and global relation. In fact, they owned or leased in 2018 more than those four companies that I mentioned owned or leased more than half of the undersea bandwidth, the total undersea bandwidth. Now, of course, there's a complex system of national legal concession agreements and contractual arrangements governed by national law that pertain to each of these cables and access to them. But the overall effect of this global network really outstrips and is more or less indifferent to national boundaries. And if we have time and questions, I can give you other illustrations of forms of um, association and connection, which really are, and or representation, which come to the fore or, or can be newly visible or newly prominent in digital technological formats, which are indifferent to state boundaries and state um, and exceed uh, state control. So the map of international law was premised on the idea of primary control being exercised by states and the governments that um, are in power within those states. And yet digital technology presents uh, maps of global power and forms of relation and connection, which really do not, are not well captured by that framework. The second challenge that emerges from the growing rise of the digital in international legal work, again, refers back to a kind of working assumption or characteristic of international law, which is that international law typically presumes that the words and actions of states' official representatives are the stuff of which law is made. So those of you who, know, who uh, work in international law 
Um, we'll think of treaty making as one form of this or custom reformation, the way in which states' intentions and actions and words are understood to con constitute the normative architecture of international law. Um, however, um, there are increasingly significant forms of norm making on the global plane, which are mediated digitally, but which don't correspond well or aren't well described in these terms and don't really hinge upon the actions, intentions and undertakings of states official representatives. So one illustration would be the protocols that govern much of um, the internet's operation, which um, those of you who work in this area will know are called uh, requests for comment. Excuse me, one second, I'll just... Um, uh, just one second. I'll just try and um, try and um, just uh, get that background noise to be one second. Excuse me, Arlo. Could you stop yelling? I'm on. I'm on it to call. Apologies for my uh, background noise. Um, so, as I was saying, uh, request for comment doctrine documents pub, um, govern. Uh, the um, or set out the common specifications to around which hardware and software around the world is typically built. So engineers developing hardware and software use requests for com uh, comments doc documents to understand, um, to ensure that their software or hardware meets and corresponds to common specifications. And these are published by the in uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, freely available and so forth. Um, so these kinds of instruments uh, produced and maintained entirely without regard to official state representatives' actions or uh, intentions or undertakings govern the infrastructure of data gathering and connectivity that almost all commercial actors around the glo globe of a certain scale now engage in. And not just tech companies, but all sorts of companies like Caterpillar and GE are increasingly data gathering, data analysis operations. And as you know, all sorts of objects are embedded with RFID um, chips, radio frequency identification chips, and are in effect conducting international relations in their communications with other F uh, RFID embedded objects around the world and exchanging data with those within the um, you know, obviously connectivity limits. So, um, so one illustration of the way in which these alternative forms of norm making and um, these alternative routes of international exchange, data exchange um, can be, have legal significance would be the way in which um, these kinds of alternative modes of norm making determine where things are understood to have occurred. So as you know, international law has traditionally been very concerned with where things happen, where a certain person is or where a certain event occurred in order to assess and determine their legal significance and attribute responsibility and rights in relation to that event or person. And it's typically been governments that have um, been, it's looked to, to determine uh, what, how to characterise a particular the legal status of a particular place. So when a new when a part of a state becomes uh, secedes from an old state, a newcomer state, we typically look at what governments say about that state to determine its legal status and to determine the legal status of events and people located in that territory. But software that carries out geolocation deduces the geolocation position of a device connected to the internet. Um, and determines where a particular device or a person holding a device is without regard to these kinds of this kind of governmental mediation. And this could have the uh, could have significance for the corresponding analysis of legal rights and responsibilities. Um, and I'll come back to an example of that when we talk about cyber warfare in a moment. So keep I see that you're on is everything okay? Yeah, okay. We're okay? Okay, good. Um, so the third challenge that I wanted to draw out is um, the one that I just mentioned then. The fact that international legal responsibilities are often very difficult to attribute 
when wrongs take digital form, when harm done by one actor against another international actor is mediated or expressed in digital form, it can often be difficult to answer the classical questions with which international law has been concerned, namely which actor um, is responsible for these wrongs and to which other actor are they accountable for that. So the cl a classic example of this is cyber attacks. So many of you would be familiar with the solar winds attack that was um, carried out in 2020. Some say it actually started much earlier, perhaps in 2019, um, that compromised multiple systems of governments and companies worldwide. And this map gives you, a, uh, which was a map from the security firm census, uh, represents um, all the Orion servers that were exposed to the solar winds attack around the world by virtue of their use of um, solar wind services. And it's been very difficult for experts concerned with this to determine who carried out this attack. So it was attributed to a, a set of actors known as UNC2452, and they've, it's been hypothesized that they are Russian bat, backed or Russian based actors, but others have suggested that it may in fact have been committed by a group of actors known as APT41, um, who are thought to be China-based or China-backed. So um, it's very difficult to determine who carried out this wrong and therefore to answer the classical questions around attribution of responsibility um, that international law has been concerned with. And the fourth and final challenge that I wanted to draw your attention to is ways in which international dispute settlement is really taking on new, rather heterodox digital forms. Um, and the illustration I want to give you of this is the way in which we might understand Google Maps to be engaging in a form of international dispute settlement. And this is something with which a team within Google Maps called the Disputed Regions Team is particularly concerned. So when presented with a territorial boundary that is controversial, that is intensely disputed, the disputed regions team will present some solution that typically involves either producing multiple versions of Google Maps that are accessible from different parts of the world or simply removing controversial um, markers, boundaries and names. So for example, this is an example um, that some of you may have read about. From 2018 onwards, um, Google Maps removed the dotted line that had previously separated Western Sahara from Morocco when you access uh, Google Maps from Morocco and also removed the name Western Sahara. So you can see this on the left. This is the version of uh, the map that one might access from Morocco. And on the right is the version of the map that I access from Sydney and which I understand people access from Western, within Western Sahara and elsewhere, which you can see shows the dotted line and also has the name Western Sahara. And as you're no doubt familiar, since 1975, um, since Morocco's seizure of this area in the face of indigenous Sahrawi opposition, um, this has been an intensely disputed boundary and the status of Western Sahara has been controversial. And so Google Maps is effectively um, achieving some settlement of this dispute by, in this instance, producing multiple versions of the map. And this is a challenge because international law dispute settlement has classically depended upon initially getting parties to agree upon a common set of facts, a common set a, a kind of common repository of knowledge as part of the dispute settlement process. Whereas here, you've got a dispute settlement process which doesn't try and achieve the production of that common repository agreement on a certain facts. It simply produces multiple repositories of knowledge, multiple versions of the world map. And there are other examples of this. Um, Kashmir appears uh, disputed, surrounded by dotted lines when you access Google Maps from Pakistan and indeed from Australia, whereas from India, it appears as part of India, I understand, according to a number of accounts in the literature on this. So four challenges uh, for international lawyers and international legal actors associated with the rise of um, 
the digital. States do not encase or capture many forms of digital power or digital connection and association. State leaders and state leaders' um, in, uh, intentions and actions and undertakings are not necessarily central in all forms of international norm making. There are powerful forms of international norm making being mediated through digital technology, which can simply bypass uh, state leaders' um, role to some extent. Um, international legal responsibilities can be a different, difficult to attribute when wrongs are um, expressed in digital form and international dispute settlement is in some cases taking this new digital form, which erodes a kind of sense of common knowledge, a common repository of knowledge, or um, removes the requirement that that be agreed upon as a part of dispute settlement. So what uh, possibilities are associated with the term to digital technology? Um, well, there are many, but let me mention a few, three. One is that it's possible through uh, techniques of digital um, data science and the use of, of alternative data sources to invest association and, and associations and actors and actions that have previously been considered quite marginal or insignificant with new value or greater recognition. And the illustration here is actually from a domestic example, not an international example. Um, this is a map of the, um, the work and the route being, um, the work done and the route followed by um, informal uh, waste management workers in Mombasa in Kenya. So this is a result of a, a, a survey that was done through um, in which these informal waste management workers were asked to use a phone and web-based application to map their work. And, um, and then this was represented and analyzed in relation to formal waste management that was being um, conducted. And it was really, the paper draws attention to the extent to which Mombasa is really dependent upon the work of these informal waste managers and that they are navigating the city in ways that are supplement and complement official or formal waste management techniques. So this is an illustration of the ways in which work being done, contributions to economies and social life, being done by actors that might previously have been hard to detect or represent or understand, can be made invested with greater value through recourse to digital technology. The second possibility, which is related really to the, to the, what I've just, the one I've just outlined, is the possibility that digital technology and the representative techniques that it makes available can possibly allow us to approach international legal responsibilities and conflicts and challenges in new formats and at new scales. So just as the famous image of Earth taken from Apollo 17 in 1972, that's known as the blue marble, you may remember that image, and it's often been said that that helped to engender in the 1970s a new environmental consciousness on the planetary scale. That that image of the Earth from Apollo 17 really transformed the way we understood and, and gave us a new sense of the fragility and the oneness of the planet. Just as that image had an incredible power um, at that time, it might be that images like this one, which was in 2013, the first comprehensive high resolution look at deforestation around the world. It shows forest loss um, between 2012 and 2000, sorry, between 2000 and 2012 in red. Um, and if you go down, you can see it in much greater detail. This was based on the analysis of hundreds of thousands of satellite image data by a team made up of government, academic and Google researchers. And it presented us with a new, new image, a new understanding of the problem of um, deforestation. And there are many other efforts to analyze deforestation using digital techniques as well. So perhaps these might allow us to develop a new consciousness, a new sense of implication and responsibility and urgency around these kinds of issues. Now, obviously there would be a lot of more work that would need to go into building that consciousness and acting upon it, but um, that is at least an opening, a possibility that digital te technology might offer. And third and finally, um, it might be uh, said that um, digital data sources 
create pro could create prospects for new prospects for international legal claim, including among potentially historically marginalised people and um, sectors. And this image is taken from the work, ongoing work of a team called Forensic Architecture based at Global Goldsmiths at the University of London in London um, that you might be familiar with. That team has been for a number of years now investigating human rights violations, including violence committed by states, police forces, militaries and corporations around the world using very sophisticated digital technology techniques. And this is an image that was um, an outcome of a project that forensic architecture undertook with support from Greenpeace using 3D modeling and uh, remote aerial sensing and geolocation to demonstrate that an Indonesian Korean palm oil conglomerate called, named Corindo had been intentionally starting forest fires in the period 2011 to 2016 as part of an, an illegal process of clearing forest in remote areas of the Indonesian province of Papua. So this is an illustration of the way in which digital technology can be deployed and serve to support potentially the making of international legal claims that might not otherwise have been possible or might not otherwise be um, able to be evidenced in the way that they can be uh, using these techniques. So a lot more to be said, but once again, the argument here is really that there are significant challenges being presented um, associated with the increasing rise of digital logics and digital infrastructures in international legal work, and that we need to confront these on their own terms to understand their specificity, and also that these might occasion or demand some rethinking of some of the traditional building blocks of international law analysis and practice. And that's the work in which I'm um, currently engaged. So with that, I'll turn to uh, questions. This uh, question mark is an installation um, I don't know, some of you might have seen images of it. It's a, made of plastic bottles. Uh, it was an installation in 2019 in Hassan Saga Lake in Hyderabad um, by the street artist Daku. Um, so it's not, it's actually a material, not a digital installation. Um, but with that, I'll over to you for questions. Thank you very much, Professor John. Um, I, I am often believe that everybody enjoyed your um, talk thoroughly. Uh, we do have a lot of questions and uh, whenever you're ready to entertain the questions, please do let me know and I will um, ask the questions to you. Please, please. I, can, okay. I don't have the chat button in front of me, so I'll just, um, yeah. Sure, sure of course. Um, the first question. Is there any way that the ILC draft articles on state responsibility could be applicable in wrongful actions in the digital world? Yes, I do think they could be, and they are being in um, all the work that's being done around cyber warfare and cyber attacks. So that's one illustration of the kind of updating and supplementing of the ILC draft articles in one area of international legal um, interaction in the digital sphere. Um, but it would be possible to think of other areas of international, the, of the other aspects of um, the ILC articles, which could warrant rethinking and, and, um, and restatement um, and refinement and development in uh, the face of digital um, forms of power and digital mediation of uh, international legal interactions um, outside the cyber attack and cyber warfare context, such as, for example, um, transboundary waste or in other forms of international wrong, um, it might be possible to um, do that work. Um, I haven't personally been focused on the ILC articles, but um, I think it's it's definitely a space to watch in this area and, uh, and it would be a great project um, to get engaged with, thinking about what aspects of those articles really need to be rethought in light of these kinds of um, challenges. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jones. Um, this, this next question, this comes from um, Professor Rizwan Rizlam, the Chair of the Department of Law. What does this digital technology mean for the Westphalian, Westphalian international legal order? Yes, it's a great question. It, I mean, there are aspects of this, of this um, turn that I'm talking about that really strengthen and reinforce the Westphalian, Westphalian order. 
So we see that states are avid users of many forms of surveillance and other intel, um, uh, um, open source intelligence and, and avid users of digital technology. So there are aspects in which um, the availability of, of data science, the availability of new data sources serves to strengthen um, state power in some respects. Um, and, um, and we can think of many illustrations of that. So it's not as though there's erosion across the board, but I do think that it presents challenges in the way that I've outlined for the Westphalian state system. So if we think of the Westphalian state system as uh, a moment of trying to gather up um, and overcome uh, religious conflict and other forms of conflict and connection, uh, conflict and um, kind of uh, establish a single model that would um, overlay uh, other forms of association as a way of um, bringing about um, an end to religious conflict. You could say that that need is the need to, to rethink that model and the capacity of that model to successfully stand astride or overlay or suppress other forms of association, other forms of um, other sites of power um, is somewhat in question. So it's never as though the Westphalian state completely over, we all know that it never completely overwhelmed alternative sources or alternative models of global connection or global power. It's never as though it was all, it was comprehensive. And yet it was plausible that we could all orient our international relations towards this single model for a good number of years, um, whether enthusiastically or critically. But there are, as I've tried to suggest today, there are many operations, including operations in, involving machine to machine interaction, which really aren't oriented towards this model, either enthusiastically or critically. They simply are more or less indifferent to this model. Obviously they depend to some extent on national law and it's not as though um, all forms of digital power bypass the Westphalian system, but there are significant operations that could be understood to be relatively indifferent to the Westphalian model. And so I think that um, this presents significant challenges as I've tried to suggest today. And you see that in international development and humanitarian work in a variety of ways. Um, for instance, when, you, when state actors start to use digital tools to understand a disaster, almost invariably, the information that flows to state actors through those tools exceeds the, the power of a state to respond. So when you have an earthquake in a certain area and you use, say, crisis mapping using Twitter, for example, there are various efforts to use social media to try and understand people's needs in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, almost invariably you will get cl um, claims or information through that which um, emanates from people outside your jurisdiction or which doesn't fit provincialities. So it's um, digital tools increasingly place demands on states that they don't have the jurisdictional power to respond to. Um, and so this is a very real challenge, I think. Thank you very much, Professor John. Um, we have a question from Ms. Antara Tasni. How would, in your opinion, the recent decisions by the Australian government on the use and the role of digital platforms affect the dissemination of information around the world. Well, um, um, she, mentioned, uh, she, she basically uh, would, want to focus, would want to focus on the implications on uh, the international digital laws and the international human rights. Yeah, so I assume um, that you mean um, the recent efforts by the Australian government to force um, Digital, major digital platforms like Facebook to pay uh, traditional media providers of content. Um, so to enter into negotiations, uh, there was a, a, so the Australian government has proposed a mandatory bargaining code, um, which would, which requires companies like Google and Facebook to pay, to enter into negotiations, to agree upon um, some remuneration for traditional content providers like media, major media organisations um, corresponding to the uh, 
access to that content via the platform. So, um, and if those traditional media providers and can't agree with Facebook, the legislation provides that the government will step in and provide for compulsory arbitration of those. So this was significant. This is um, significant potentially as an indicator of um, the direction in which governments seem to be increasingly inclined to go, but it's still quite narrow. So it's very much focused upon major players in the traditional media and the problem of the sort of obsolescence of the old scale, old style newspaper in many parts of the world. So it's really not grappling. So it may potentially be an interesting um, example that other governments may well follow. And there's indications that other governments are very interested in either following. M similar to the way in which Australia, you, I don't know if you, you may recall that Australia had a number of main major um, conflicts with tobacco companies because it changed its packaging um, and required tobacco to be packaged. So when you buy cigarettes in Australia, they're packaged in a uniform package and the package contains all sorts of gruesome images of all the diseases that you get if you smoke. So, and they said you had, the government insisted that you had to, um, that all tobacco had to be sold using this uniform package. And this was the subject of investor state dispute uh, settlement, which the Australian government won. And, in the, and then other governments, my understanding is other governments have fo uh, followed suit. So you might see something like that copycat um, effect of these recent measures, but it's really still a very narrow tackling of the vast array of issues that are associated with um, dominant the dominant position of companies like Google, not just in the media space, but as I explained, in the undersea cable space as well. So it's really just um, tackling uh, the tip of the iceberg, but it could potentially be influential in that media regulation space and in um, competition uh, regulation around the world. Not because Australia is particularly significant or a big player, but just because it's, um, it's something that they've been able to effectively negotiate and bring into effect. Thank you, Professor Jones. Um, another question. Do you envisage, uh, envisage um, increasing Leave new international legal rules or norms being created by non-state actors. So, would you mind to keep just saying the question again? Do I envisage? Sorry. You, um, you said, do you envisage um, increasingly new international legal rules or norms being created by non-state actors? So yes, so what I was suggesting was that in many ways we're seeing norm making already underway, but it's not as though we're seeing, uh, I wasn't suggesting that things like treaties or customary law are actually being made by major digital players or through um, the interaction of, of say um, internet connected devices. But what I was suggesting is that there are significant forms of norm making, significant forms of control, which take effect um, without on the global plane, and which are effectively regulating conduct, say regulating the design of software and hardware, or um, uh, regulating um, the exchange of data and other forms of interaction across state boundaries. Which, um, which take other forms. Um, and so I gave the example of RFCs as one illustration of the network of protocols, the kind of hierarchical aspects of the internet, which could be understood as the normative architecture of digital, the digital economy and digital interaction around the globe. Um, and, um, and I also gave an illustration of geolocation, not so much as a norm making, but as a, the making of determinations which can be uh, have normative significance for um, international legal questions. Um, so I do think it's already underway, but I'm not suggesting that um, robots are going to be making treaties or that's kind of, it's not that I'm imagining the traditional form of norm making being taken over by new actors. What I'm suggesting is that we that if we think of norm making in a pluralistic sense, we can see that there is already significant norm making underway um, on the global plane, 
which doesn't correspond to um, really treaty custom or even traditional forms of soft law guidelines, best practices, that kind of thing, because some aspects of this are really expressed in um, material form. They're really expressed in, the, in, in things rather than um, in standards or rules. I mean, obviously standards, the ISO is, is, has standards on computer um, technology and digital technology as well, um, but um, there are aspects of it which don't really even correspond to traditional understandings of soft law on the international plane. Thank you, Professor Jones. Um, another question. Although not your main focus of today's talk, you have alluded to digital diplomacy. Would you call it diplomacy or anathema to diplomacy? Would I call it diplomacy or? Anathema to diplomacy. Anathema to diplomacy. Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm just starting a project on diplomats at the moment. So I'm just starting to, I really know very little about diplomacy really, because it's not something I've looked at. I've engaged with diplomat, diplomatic um, actors in a number of different research projects, but I haven't really investigated the way in which diplomats interact and the kind of knowledge and normative world of diplomats. So this is something about which I really know quite little at this stage. So anything I say is very speculative and more a matter of hunches than knowledge. But I would say that um, it's not, no, I mean, I don't think it's anathema to, um, to traditional diplomacy necessarily, because there are aspects of, of digital diplomacy, which um, kind of mimic old forms of statecraft and old forms of threat which states made um, to other states um, both covert and overt so there are um, there are aspects of it which which extend um, so the way in which states have used propaganda or threats sorry um, the way in which states have used threats of exposure um, in the past, for instance, um, as there are certain ways in which digital technology extends that. But, um, but there are, so it's not entirely opposed to it, but there are aspects of it which I think do um, change the tenor and change the, um, change, change the nature of statecraft that diplomats engage in. And we saw that obviously with um, former President Trump I mean, just the, the way in which his own State Department seemed to be so often caught off guard and surprised by things he would say that have that had international legal significance, international diplomatic significance on Twitter, really suggested the way in which the um, conduct of, of Twitter diplomacy by him completely bypassed the traditional architecture of the State Department. Um, so there, and that does seem to be uh, really fundamentally um, anathema, you might say, to conventional modes of forms of respect and deference and traditional forms of hierarchy that have operated around the diplomatic endeavour. But as I said, it's something I've just started to look at and I hope to be able to say more um, maybe next time we talk. Thank you, Professor Jones. Um... This is our last question, and um, um, we actually have plenty of questions, but uh, due to lack of time, we're not being able to take all of them. Uh, this is the last question to you, Professor John. Um, has the increasing use of digital technology by states and international organizations paid due deference to, uh, to human rights? Paid, has, it, has the increasing use paid due deference due to- Due deference to human rights. Um, yeah, so, I guess I would say the short answer would be no, um, because they kind of, as I've suggested, they operate un, under different logical frameworks in many respects. So there are interesting efforts at the national and international plane to try and get these two frameworks to interact productively. But in general terms, I would say that the normative architecture of digital technology and the sort of regime of mostly contract that it is governed under is more or less um, indifferent to concerns of human rights. Now, of course, many major international pl players on the digital economy, the big companies that I alluded to earlier, off they often have human rights offices, they have campaigns around human rights, they're engaged in what they describe as um, 
data for good or data for development or humanitarian data initiatives. So they see themselves as playing a role in defence of human rights, in defence of, and particularly they're very vocal in defence of freedom of speech um, in a particular way of understanding that term. So on one hand, you, um, the key players in the digital economy seem to be big champions of human rights, but I would still maintain that the way in which they conduct business is fundamentally rooted around a different set of concerns, a different logic, um, which is not only a digital logic, but it's also an analog logic, which is dominated by um, private law contract. And, um, and of course, not only, but dominated by uh, contractual models of interaction and um, agreement. And so um, I think those who are working on trying to get those two logics to speak to each other in productive and, and rights protective ways still have a lot of work ahead. Um, but there is a lot of work on that. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting area. Thank you very much, Professor Jones. Um, and uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, I'd like to bring to your notice that uh, we will be having, we, we have recorded this particular um, talk of Professor Jones and it, it will be available in our YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to it. Uh, Professor Jones, thank you very much. Is there anything that you want to say uh, for the participants, for the people of our country, for, for uh, the students and faculty members of North South University or um, other universities who will present here to the no, just to say thank you so much for your time and for engaging and for these terrific questions. And um, I really am honoured to be able to chat with you about this. And um, it was a pleasure. And feel free to get in touch, especially when the world opens up. And if people are travelling again this way, I'd always be happy to hear from, um, you know, any of the students at any time. So, um, and all the best through these challenging times. I know it's been hard on everyone. So I, I stay safe and... Um, and best wishes to everyone. The pleasure was ours, uh, Professor Jones. Thank you very much again, and thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.